Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Will Charlton, Arable Marketing Manager for Lee McGrain in the UK. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this morning. This is the first of our Ask the Breeder webinars, which is brought to you in conjunction with Farmers Weekly. Um, the objective of these uh, webinars, and there's going to be a series of them uh, um, focused around the main arable crops for the UK, uh, will, be able, will be to provide you with an opportunity to ask our breeding experts how, what and when new innovation might be coming from the plant breeding industry uh, in the future. Um, before we get going into the main content this morning, um, uh, just a little bit of admin. So um, timings wise, we'll, 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 we'll be done by 10 o'clock. Um, uh, I will very shortly introduce you to my colleague uh, Vasilis. Um, uh, we'll have a, a very, very brief um, kind of uh, description of our um, Aussie rate breeding um, objectives um, for the UK with Lee McGrain. Um, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Some of you have very kindly al already submitted some questions, which we'll, we'll start off with. Um, and we also have a couple of polls and things and, and by all means, ask questions as we go. OK, next slide, please. So introduce you to my, my, my colleague. Vasilis. Um, uh, he's, Vas is responsible for eight out of 13 of the current um, UK recommended winter Aussie rape varieties. Um, he's also the first Aussie rape breeder in the UK to bring high yields with turnip yellows virus resistance and pod shatter resistance. Um, uh, and uh, uh, very recently, he was recognised as one of the 20 most innovative breeders in the European seed sector. So, good morning, Vas. Good morning, Will. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, if we could go on to the next slide, please, Nev. Just a, a very quick intro overall from me um, as to what we're looking at um, from the Lima Grain side in terms of plant breeding efforts. Um, you know, we are um, hoping to develop crop varieties with high yields, improve resources, um, use efficiency, reduced environmental impact. Um, uh, plant breeders is a major contributor to the meeting the goals of sustainability in agriculture. Um, we are moving to a new environment where genetics contributes more value uh, to integrated crop protection on the farm. Um, uh, we can we can see that in terms of you know increased regulation from from crop protection has meant we've lost some um, uh, key products which control key agronomic challenges and. Um, uh, Plant breeding is moving more into that dimension to, to help overcome some of those challenges where traditionally um, uh, crop protection products may well have um, uh, uh, been controlling those. Um, I'll now, um, on the next slide, then pass over to, to Vass, who'll give you a brief introduction on uh, specifically in also rape breeding. Uh, thank you, Will. Um, so, as Will said, Lima Grain is, is, is a pure seed company, uh, so genetics is really. Um, uh, our, our DNA, uh, excuse the pun there. Um, so at the very heart of our strategy is always innovation. Innovation in terms of the genetic traits that we bring into the market. Um, and here you can just see a, a very simple timeline of the, uh, of the type of innovations that we, uh, that we have incorporated in, into our uh, uh, germplasm and uh, follow up in, uh, as a marketable product. Um, starting uh, from, from what is now considered standard traits, the like of, uh, for example, um, uh, gene-specific resistance to former stem canker, and also more specific traits um, like resistance to club root, for example. Um, uh, but of course, our um, flagship innovation uh, is, uh, is obviously the introduction of uh, turnip yellow virus resistance back in uh, 2014. Um, and Lima Green has been at the forefront of uh, this um, uh, this type of research for this particular trait um, for, for quite some time. Our efforts for this particular trait started way back in the early 90s. Um, but you can see how long it takes for something to move from the innovation phase into um, uh, to application uh, and then into the farm. Um, so, uh, and, and most recently, uh, uh, this year, we have uh, launched our new trade that relates to um, nitrogen use efficiency uh, under the, the umbrella uh, title NFLEX. 
So the, the whole purpose of all this uh, innovation uh, um, chain is obviously uh, to achieve the genetic potential of the uh, of the varieties. So if we go to the next slide, um, it gives you very briefly the four main pillars of our breeding strategy. And the first pillar, as I explained, is a discovery and innovation phase where all those particular traits um, depicted here as, as uh, pieces of a, a jigsaw puzzle. They were developed, the right resources, both genetic resources and all the breeding tools we, uh, we need for, uh, uh, to, to work with those traits uh, are established, discovered and established. Um, and then we move on uh, what I'd like to call a precision breeding phase, where all those components they're put together in, a, uh, in the most effective possible way uh, on top of very high uh, genetic yield potential. Um, and of course, the third element, which is uh, quite a unique uh, characteristic these days for, uh, for the breeding uh, company, is that we breed specifically under UK conditions. Um, in, in, in the UK, we are, I mean, as Glimagrain, it was a conscious decision to keep a, what we call a full uh, breeding program. So right at the beginning of the very first cross, all the way to um, the official trials, recommended list trials and into the market. So we really breed under UK conditions throughout, instead of breeding material from usually from the continent, and just select at the very latest stages, just pre-application um, in the official trial system. And of course, what overarches uh, all those elements is a continuous assessment of market requirements. We continuously um, adjust our breeding program in order to fit, in order to fit the requirements uh, of the of the UK grower. And uh, having, as I say, a complete breeding program here in the UK really allow us to make those very agile adjustments. Uh, based on what the um, uh, the requirements of the UK growers are um, uh, for for the for the crop, so I think that pretty much wraps up what uh, we wanted to say um, by means of introduction. So I think we'll over to you to um, uh, to start with the questions. Fantastic, thanks, Fas. So. Um, uh, we'll start with some of the pre-submitted questions, which some of you sent to us before um, before today. Um, it becomes no great surprise that there, there was quite a few questions around cabbage stem flea beetle and the prospect of um, uh, varietal resistance um, in the future. Um, so as an example of that, um, we have a question here um uh from emma harmer which is how far away are we from cabbage stem flea beetle resistant varieties of osr okay so uh i think cabbage stem flea beetle is uh, in the minds of everybody for quite some time and um uh, i think there isn't there isn't a very good answer to uh, to this uh, to this question um so the main problem with um Working with resistance on uh, on, on insects is that uh, it, it tends to be very complicated. Um, so, and I would start by giving why it is difficult uh, to work with any type of resistance, but this particular one, um, uh, this one in, in in particular. So, there are several stages in uh, in introducing or developing um, uh, resistant varieties. In, for, for disease and in particular for, for insects. First of all, we have to make sure that um, variation, natural variation of this particular resistance exists in, in, in nature. And for crop species, that usually comes from um, wild relatives, ancestral species, um, uh, so sources like that. So once we identify that, um, we have to make sure that uh, it can be introduced on our elite materials or varieties which are basically able to grow on farm um, uh, and and this is by by no means a, 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 an easy an easy task and and the reason being is that every time you reduce um, a, a trait from an a, what we in breeding terms we call an exotic source um, it, it tends to uh, to bring with it um, uh, quite few, most of the times, undesirable characteristics, uh, that being reduces yield, reduces quality, and so on and so forth. So it does require a, a very long process of 
in essence, cleaning that particular background in order to keep only the useful uh, bits and get rid of all the undesirable bits. Um, I mentioned before how long it took us, for example, when we moved the TYV trait from its uh, original source into a lead material and then into a sort of marketable variety. I mean, it took about 25 years. It took about 25 years. Um, and that resistant came actually from a very closely related species to, to the orchid rape. So um, when it comes to uh, copper stem flea beetle, of course, uh, we, we, can, we haven't seen anything at the moment that to suggest that there is uh, a big enough variation in the existing um, elite germplasm in winter all seed rape that would make the move from that um, into a sort of modern varieties uh, easy if we start and, and we basically we have to start looking in a sort of um, um, uh, wilder species uh, or uh, other brassica species altogether. Um, Again, that work is, um, uh, is, is in progress. Uh, there are, there's a number of projects going on at the moment, screening genetic, what we call genetic resources, i.e. ancestral species um, uh, or other brassica um, uh, wild relatives. Um, but it's, it's far from conclusive uh, at the moment. So uh, first thing first, we are missing the source of the resistance. So um, the second is, once we, even if we find the, the resource, once we find it, it will take uh, a huge effort at pre-breeding stage and then a breeding stage in order to clean the background and bring the, uh, the right uh, genetic elements into a, the elite material. And then obviously there will be a, um, a process of, a long process of breeding in order to uh, make sure that uh, uh, you get the, this particular trait or this particular gene that confers the resistance. Um, um, into a, a, an elite variety uh, that is a high yielding and has all the other agronomic characteristics that is uh, required by the farmers. Um, so, as you can see, there are quite a lot of hurdles uh, in, in this process. Um, and although we have, we have started working on those particular elements, uh, the road is, um, is, is still quite long um, and, and it's not easy. Um, and uh, of course, what I'm talking about is um, uh, what we call a classic approach to, to breeding. So, um, and, and not, uh, not in other type of interventions like gene editing, for example, uh, that those approaches, they tend to speed up part of the process. Uh, and in particular, when we have to move genes uh, from one source to, uh, to another, uh, because you have to know there's uh, there's a big issue with incompatibility between the different species when we when we have to sort of uh, uh, move one trait for from uh, a wild relative, let's say, uh, into a, a winter rose trait. So that's not always easy using just simple crosses. Um, so there are technical issues, uh, uh, but also there are. I think we are still in the stage where we don't know where this source of resistance will come from, okay? As I say, there's a, the, there's a huge work going on at the moment uh, across Europe, as a matter of fact, quite a few countries are very actively engaged in breeding programs in screening different genetic resources. So once we have identified something that, um, that, that looks promising and looks um, uh, workable um, and scalable, the breeding sort of scale, we have to start thinking how we can actually move it into our modern germplasm and then start um, working on the varieties. So um, I think it's a very long answer to say that uh, we are actually quite far away from finding resistance. And the question was specific for resistance. So I'm, the answer I'm giving you is specific for resistance. When we start talking about uh, tolerance, then in essence, we lower a little bit the benchmark as to how we work because um, uh, we start looking on, on other characteristics that may confer tolerance. Um, and I would probably go even a, step, um, a level lower than that. I would say, with, what are the other characteristics in a variety that will make it probably cope better? Okay. So uh, I think uh, whilst we are looking for the, the resistance to uh, this particular um, pest, 
Uh, at the same time, we are also looking for uh, other characteristics that uh, we can introduce much faster into a variety in order to make it uh, to cope better for, um, with the pressure. And, and at the end of the day, at the, sort of at the growers' level, what you need is a crop which is financially viable. Brilliant. Um, great stuff, Vas. We did um, uh, run a poll uh, whilst we were whilst you were talking there. Um, so the question to the audience was, what IPM strategies have you tried to help mitigate damage from cabbage stem flea beetle and to select or apply? Um, so um, a real mix, as you'd imagine. Um, so 9.1% uh, um, uh, have tried companion and or catch cropping. Um, uh, um, 31.8 have tried uh, drilling earlier or later. 22.7% um, uh, have tried changing um, establishment method. 27.3 um, uh, have tried choosing more vigorous varieties. Um, and um, uh, two to nine percent have tried um, higher seed rates. So a real mix, but um, the the main ones there are a change in drilling rate, change in establishment method, and using varieties with with higher vigor. Is that what, what you'd have uh, expected from that, that question, Vas? Uh, yeah, I think it's, um, uh, I think since 2014, where the problem really sort of uh, hit the sector, um, there's been quite a lot of um, uh, work, mainly agronomy work, uh, that were looking at different um, uh, sort of agronomic practices and interventions. Um, but I, I think the the number of different responses that we that, that we receive really uh, points towards the uh, the fact that at the moment there isn't a silver bullet, and at the end of the day, it will be an integrated approach that combines um, uh, genetics and the, and the characteristics that the variety brings into it, uh, that goes beyond whether the variety is, as I said, the resistance or tolerance. Because as of now, there are no evidence that shows that one variety is more tolerant than another or resist definitely is not resistant than another but even at the level of tolerance uh, but uh, moving towards a, a model where an integrated approach that combines the right um, the right genetics uh, the right agronomic practices um, together obviously with um, uh, with the available chemistry that, uh, that there is at the moment uh, would probably get you um, out of the woods, um, for lack of a better word. Hmm. Brilliant. We also um, then asked a question um, uh, to the audience. Um, what do you think is the most important trait for an autoroute variety to have in order for it to best survive cabbage stem flea beetle? Um, and you see the results are fairly conclusive. 66.7 um, uh, say in early vigour. Um, uh, the other options there being ability to drill very early, uh, resistance to other pets and diseases such as turnip yellows virus, and then finally ability to compensate for damage early in the spring. So certainly the focus there on on um, uh, on autumn establishment um, uh, in terms of varietal characteristics. Uh yeah, and I, I think that it's, it's pretty much highlights again that um, I think UK growers they're getting quite uh, quite a lot of experience uh, working with um, uh, with this particular pressure, and they are they are adjusting the um, uh, the way that they they um, they work with the crop um, in, in in a good way, um, and I think the. The majority of those interventions, they uh, they will be effective. Probably a combination of that would be the most effective one. Um, I think it's interesting that you mentioned early vigor. Um, uh, I would I would dissect it a little bit more, and and I would point towards another characteristic which has been probably overlooked, uh, just because it's a very difficult thing to um, to evaluate even at the breeding stage. Um, but we have been working on on that for the for the last few years. Um, so I would say, don't only look at the early vigor, whatever, whichever way you, um, you define that, but I would, I would dissect that early vegetative period of the crop, so between um, sowing or emergence and end of November, beginning of, of December, uh, where the crop sort of starting to put itself to sleep. Um, 
and there are two two distinct phases there. One is what what I call the speed of establishment, and establishment really is when you have the first pair of true leaves actively growing, because that indicates that the crop has really established um, uh, a root system that can sustain uh, growth that goes beyond uh, the reserves of the plant coming from the actual seed. Uh, and the next and the next phase is uh, uh, what I call the the autumn dynamic growth, which is the capacity of the crop to build up biomass uh, in uh, sort of between between September and uh, and, and December. Um, so most people usually consider vega at the end point, which is how green basically is the crop before winter or how much of the ground was covered before winter. Um, that's that's an important attribute. That's 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 fair enough. Um, uh, but I think um, growers will be hugely benefited if they start looking on that early stage, the establishment stages, which is the first true leaves of the crop. How does the variety really behaves about that? And and as I said, we've been actually um, assess this sort of information in in, in all in all our varieties. So this information does exist now uh, for some of those varieties, and um, and I think this is also has um, have been now um, corroborated by the recently published re um, research of Stabas um, from from ADAS, and I think there will be the resource in our in our link so people can go and refer to it. It's a very nice report. As a matter of fact, it's the first report. Um, that really demystifies quite a lot of for the, the various anecdotal evidence and myths around um, uh, techniques and methodologies uh, against um, uh, the um, So it's an AHDB uh, funded research uh, carried out by ADAS. Um, but this research also showed that um, uh, those early stages, the way that the variety uh, behaves and um, uh, the, the establishment phase, um, uh, it's, it's very important on, uh, on how the, the, the crop actually behaves in terms of um, uh, feeding damage from, uh, from the adults. Um, so uh, what, we have, what we have been working on internally, it seems that has been corroborated also by external data as well, which is always very reassuring. So I would say when it comes to vigor, um, it, it's good to, uh, to see a little bit deeper than that. So don't look only how much, uh, how fast the crop builds up biomass, but also how fast really establishes uh, in those critical few weeks after drilling. Fantastic. Thank you. Just uh, one more question here on a follow up to that um, from David Lines. So, uh, this question is, Vasilis, when you spoke at the AOCC conference, you mentioned that the older single zero varieties that are higher in glucosinolates were less palatable to the cabbage stem flea beetle. And that although this is an undesirable trait, there were other similar chemicals in the plant that had a similar effect. Are you any closer to going down this route? Um, no, again, I mean, it's... Um I think it's very, as I said, it's a very, it's, it's a very difficult thing to move from uh, uh, from indications or trends um, to the level where you can establish uh, cause and effect. So, I mean, causality is always a very difficult thing to establish. And um, uh, and again, I think the main problem is if we start messing up with uh, things that affect quality, for example, and. Uh, then we introduce a very undesirable characteristics which will effectively um, um, jeopardize the the commercial the commercial survivability of the crop so it's as i said sometimes there are solutions but those solutions they are not uh, they're very difficult to make them commercially relevant um, and uh, you, you're messing up with pathways that they have other detrimental effects so it's, uh, I think we are, we are always in genetics and in breeding in particular, we are facing trade-offs all the time. And you have to say, right, um, which, which of those trade-offs are actually acceptable or will be acceptable in the market, which ones they are not. Um, so, and definitely I think glucosinolates 
not only glucosinol, it's, I mean, there is, there's probably a host of other um, compounds uh, that can, that, that may have sort of uh, repellent effects or not, uh, and to what extent we really don't know yet. Um, uh, but I think uh, all the, all this all this work is still is still ongoing. Uh, it's uh, we are um, we are examining every sim every uh, every possible path, and then we evaluate. Um, and by we, I mean the the, uh, the breeding and scientific community, uh, in order to see what is the right combination and which of those uh, paths really lead us to a. To the fastest possible solutions. I mean, that's the other thing. I mean, it's a scale, it's a time scale that we are talking about because some solutions, uh, I mean, if, if a solution is 20 years from now, uh, then uh, it's not really uh, something that we can pursue um, uh, compared to something else that may give you, uh, it may be less effective, but it, it gives you a, a, some sort of solution in, uh, in, in five or six years time. Uh, which for breeding in breeding terms, uh, that's probably what we're looking at. Um, so find something that within the next five or six years, or within uh, a full breeding cycle, you get something um, that, although may not resemble resistance, but at least gives you that sort of uh, extra level of um, of tolerance or something that makes the uh, the variety cope better. Uh, again, I think I, I, I think. Um, really don't don't discard the notion of uh, of having varieties that they cope better uh, because the short term solution it will it will look something like that uh, a sort of uh, a variety that um, that has the characteristics that makes it to cope better or coping better with uh, uh, with the pressure um, and uh, and again even that task is not is not easy uh, because uh, it, the problem with uh, with flea beetle is not one dimensional you have the feeding uh, damage from the adults, but also you've got the damage from the larvae. And sometimes the solution is not the same for the two problems, okay? Uh, so it's, uh, the, the, the genetic solution is more convoluted than, than it looks on the surface. Um, Fantastic. Um, moving away from people now, Vas, we have a question from, um, Brian McComb, uh, can you please summarize the main different me, the main meaningful differences between restored hybrids and conventional varieties? Okay, well, that's a, that's a very nice question, actually. Back to the back to the very fundamental of um, of, of rape breeding. So, um, conventional varieties. Are, the other name for that is is open pollinating varieties, and I think the clue is in the name. So, with the open pollinating varieties. The reason, for example, why, why um, uh, growers are able to farm saved is because um, the, uh, the seed of the open pollinating variety or the conventional variety um, breeds true. Um, if it's grown in isolation, okay, in field conditions, they are not growing in isolation, so the variety is not 100% uh, true, but nevertheless, it's very close to the original seed. Uh, with a hybrid, you cannot do that. Uh, because the hybrid uh, has always two components, and I will refer now to what we uh, we call the Obura system, which is a system that uh, has been the most the most popular one. Uh, uh, other breeders using a, a slightly different system, but whichever system you uh, you use, uh, you require at least two components. So in the Obura system, you have two components: the female component, and we call it uh, female because uh, it has only um, female reproductive organs, so it doesn't produce any pollen. Um, and uh, you need something which we refer usually as a restore, or it's the male component uh, that is um, that carries the carries the pollen. So the problem is that if you have a, a female plant uh, which is restored by a non-restorer, something else, another variety, or whatever that does that doesn't carry that. Uh, restoraging, um, the hybrid you produced is basically going to be sterile. And so basically, if you sow that seed, you're not going to harvest anything because the fertility on the, on the hybrid you produce is, um, is, is not restored. Um, so you do require that what we call a restoraging to restore the fertility of the female. 
Um, so uh, the the problem, however, is that uh, as a as a as a hybrid, if you farm saved seed for that, it's not going to be that hybrid anymore. So it's going to be something that segregates for all sorts of things uh, because it's not is the hybrid itself is not a fixed line the same way that a conventional variety is. So. Uh, and of course, the, the, the big difference is the way that we produce it. So as you can understand, a conventional variety is much easier to produce and much cheaper to produce. And as a matter of fact, this is much more, um, uh, it's, it's much cheaper to, uh, to uh, create it at the, in, in the breeding sense. Um, with, a, with a hybrid system, you need to create, you need, as a matter of fact, you need to have a breeding system, a breeding uh, program to create the female um, component of your hybrids and you have a breeding program that creates the restore part of your component and then you have to put those uh, two together in the field you have to ensure that the pollen from one goes to the other which means that um, uh, the um, at the production level at the seed production level the um, uh, the amount of seed you get out of your seed production it's is usually much reduced um, and of course you have to destroy your male uh, part of your seed production uh, because you don't want that seed um, to be in your commercial seed. So there are, there are a lot of stages that add a cost. Um, and of course, that partially explain also the higher cost of the hybrids. Obviously, it has higher cost to use um, uh, compared to conventional. Uh, of course, what the hybrid system gives you is uh, it gives you exactly the flexibility that I explained in my, in my introductory slide. It helps you to speed up that process of putting the different uh, pieces of the puzzle together. So that's why the hybrids are the ones that they carry all the traits, uh, because by modifying the males and the females um, uh, components of the of the hybrid, you can tailor the solution to whatever you want. If you want, for example, to produce a variety uh, that has a TYB pot shutter resistant RLM7. Um, gene clear field, um, you can actually do it by just putting those components together as you see fit. Uh, with a conventional variety, you have to develop it with those traits right at the beginning of the, your first cross. Uh, so it makes you uh, a lot less agile to adapt to, your, to the market needs. Uh, so the hybrid system, and this is where the value of the hybrid is, um, it carries a lot of those those traits um, and and also really really pioneered the the way that we handle the crop and the way that we introduce new traits into um, uh, uh, in, in, into the market. So um, as uh, as breeding systems, as I say, they are they are, they are completely different. Uh, they are both serve the, the purposes and uh, and don't forget that when the um, winter rose seed back in the seventies uh, first introduced. And for quite quite some time, for probably more than two decades, uh, conventional varieties, varieties were the standard. But as we we started becoming more and more sophisticated on the on the crop, and we developed more and more innovation in the crop, uh, the, the the hybrid system really allowed us to um, uh, to make those traits available to market very quickly. Uh, so it's the the hybridization system uh, that, uh, that that is used now is really powerful in that respect. Um, and of course, um, usually hybrids, because we are you by crossing those two components, you you do sort of enhance the um, uh, most of the cases anyway um, the vigor of the of the resulted um, uh, hybrid. Uh, you do get those extra benefits of having more vigorous plants, plus that they. Um, uh, they, they can establish and they accumulate uh, biomass uh, quite uh, quite well uh, compared to to conventionals. Uh, although that's not uh, that's not a rule. There are exceptions. You, you can still get very very vigorous um, uh, conventional varieties. Uh, but as I said, that extra uh, hybrid vigor, uh, which uh, which which is observable in every in every hybrid crop, so in in every every crop uh, where you combine those two. Um, when you combine two components to make a hybrid, the hybrid vigor is, is always there as part of the biological process. Brilliant. <coughs> Thanks, Vaz. Thanks, Vaz. Uh, uh, moving into a more kind of general <laughs> thing, so we have a question from Olivia Cooper. 
Uh, are there any drawbacks to CRISPR gene editing techniques outside of obviously EU regulations? Um, I mean, drawbacks, uh, I mean, this is a bit of a um, sort of very general umbrella. Um, uh, I mean, as a, the technique itself, uh, there are no evidence at the moment that, that points towards uh, a, a detrimental effect of the actual practice itself. Um, it's the same way um, that, uh, uh, that other, other breeding techniques, uh, they, uh, that are as safe as um, uh, as the data suggests. I mean, at the moment, there are no detrimental effects. They haven't been reported. Um, it hasn't been used for uh, for very long time. This particular method, um, but nevertheless, there is there is nothing inherently um, uh, inherent into the actual method. And CRISP, CRISPR is is just just one of the tools that is used for for genome editing. There are other techniques as well. There are other methodologies. Um, but as I said. So far, the evidence um, that um, that exists don't support any any detrimental effects in uh, in, in that respect. And um, uh, and as as I said, it's it's not, it's not something that uh, um, that we haven't been working with for, for a very long time. But for the for the time that we have been working, uh, we haven't seen anything that suggests that it can be it can be a sort of um, uh, any detriment to uh, to anything. As I said, there's nothing in, inherent to the actual methodology that um, that can point towards a, a detrimental towards a detrimental effect. And as I said, there's no data that backs that. Backs that. Um, Excellent. Um, uh, we have a question uh, going back to uh, variety selection um, from Julian Del Curto. Um, uh, what is the latest drilling variety for oilseed rape? Um, I mean, it may be best to talk around kind of the characteristics that you'd want for a late drilling variety, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I think I've already sort of um, touched on that um, uh, in my previous answers. But I mean, what you, when you want to, um, it's, a very, it's a very good question because obviously the, the the drilling date, um, it does play a big factor in, in controlling um, cabastem flibido. And it seems that the, the late window um, is, um, is also as, probably as beneficial as the early window. Um, but again, what you look, what you look at the variety, uh, really what you want is, is a variety that have built up um, a reasonable amount of, uh, of biomass um, uh, before winter, before the variety basically uh, um, start preparing itself for, for overwintering. Um, and why this is important? Uh, because it, it, in essence, what we, I mean, in the UK, we don't have the problem of, of winter kill so much because the winters tend to be on the mild side compared to, uh, let's say, continental uh, Europe. Um, we need a variety that builds enough biomass so it gives it, um, it gives as much uh, reserves uh, to start the new growing season. So, because biomass in essence means nitrogen. So the more nitrogen you you sort of um, manage to build into your canopy, um, the, the, um, the the better um, uh, the the start earlier on in the season. So as a as a crop moves on in February into stem, stem elongation. Um, so. I would say this is the this is one of the main characteristics to get a variety uh, which is which has um, the capacity to build up uh, enough biomass before it goes to overwinter. Um, and uh, I would say those varieties they tend to be the hybrid varieties. They just have this extra um, sort of um, uh, what I refer as autumn dynamic growth. So they can they have the capacity to, to accumulate. Um, biomass um, faster. Um, so, and again, that refers back to the hybrid vigor. So, again, it's a biological process. Um, it's, it's nothing to do whether a conventional variety or a hybrid variety is better than uh, a conventional hybrid variety is better than a, a, a conventional variety uh, in terms of, of yield. But I'm referring to this particular biological sort of function, uh, which is the hybrid vigor. So, uh, hybrid varieties they 
they generally tend to build up more biomass faster just because the growth uh, rate is faster in this particular type of material. Brilliant. We have four or five minutes left. Uh, one uh, very quick last question. Um, uh, then we've we've got another poll which we'll we'll just reflect on uh, before we wrap up at the end. So um, uh, just a, a, a quick final question here. This is from um, Hattie Roberts. And the question is, what are the main genetic differences between spring and winter oilseed rape? OK, so I mean, the main difference between the two crops is the requirements of um, uh, the requirements of fertilization for them to, to flower. Obviously, um, spring rape has a much faster cycle. It doesn't require to be over winter uh, to flower. Um, uh, Winter also drape is, is exactly the other, uh, the other way. Um, so uh, what you have to bear in mind though is that uh, there's still quite a significant difference uh, in most cases in terms of performance. Okay, Winter also drape varieties uh, tend to yield um, much better than, than spring uh, rape. So in terms of the, um, uh, apart, from, apart from the, uh, the differences in um, in the flowering behavior, if um, if you wish, um, the the two types uh, they they are both the same the same genus, the same species that they are, they are the same basically um, <clears throat> the same genus and the same species, but the only difference is um, is um, uh, the, the the behavior um, at, at at flowering. So, in terms of traits, um, uh, I think these days you can. Uh, uh, you can find spring rape varieties with uh, with certain traits as well, the same way that you find with winter rose rape. Um, obviously, the progress in Europe, at least, of uh, of um, uh, spring rape has been uh, much slower. And I'm talking about progress in terms of the of the genetic um, of the genetics of it, uh, simply because it's less important crop in um, in, in Europe than in, uh, um, in in the other continents, like in. Canada, Australia, and so on. Um, so it's, it's inevitable that uh, winter rose rape, in terms of the technology we incorporate in those varieties, is always far um, uh, far above that of the, the spring rape. But that reflects primarily the fact uh, that uh, one one type of uh, crop is um, is more popular than others. So obviously, the effort, the breeding effort, is much higher on winter rose rape than in spring. Um, uh, but again, in terms of it. Uh, um, in, in terms of the type of um, or the genetic differences between the, the, the two of them, um, as I said, the, the main difference is the requirements for, uh, for vandalization in order to flower in, in, uh, later on in the development of the crop. Excellent. Um, just finally, now, uh, Vasan, you'll be, um, uh, I'm sure you'd be pleased to say, um, personally, based on kind of um, where a lot of your work's been over, over the last few years, we asked, um, we asked the audience, what do you think has been the most important development in oilseed rape breeding in the last 15 years? Um, and um, coming out in front there is turnip yellows virus resistance at 40%. Um, saying that's the most important development. Um, after that would then be pod shatter resistance. Um, and then the remaining answers split between um, uh, increased growth output, um, herbicide tolerance, clear fields, um, increased um, foliar disease resistance and um, improved vigor. Um, so clearly um, uh, turnip yellows, pod shatter, followed by pod shatter coming out on top there. Um. Well, that's uh, that's really that's really nice to uh, to hear, actually, and um, uh, and that's pretty much. I think that pretty much reflects the uh, you know as as geneticists they like to to put things on a on a chronological timeline and and find, trying to find milestones of uh, in terms of the the genetic achievements um, in, uh, in in the history of our of our science and uh, and I think when we when we look at sort of winter rose drape. Um, I think, from my point of view, one of the uh, the key milestone, the history of winter rose drape breeding, uh, it was the introduction, obviously, of, um, uh, of uh, RLM seven uh, based resistance for uh, for Foma, because that that was um, 
uh, really what uh, uh, what put on the map the the, the hybrid orchid rape um, and and TUIV. Um, so TUIV as the second sort of milestone. Um, and between between the two milestones, uh, I think we had almost twenty years um, in um, in development. So it really shows how. Um, uh, how long does it take to, to make the next big step in terms of genetic um, um, uh, improvement? Um, so, and, and I would always say, at the end of the day, the, the only reason why we introduce all those traits in each variety, uh, and we, we now we have, we have moved from working on single trait varieties to, uh, to stacking traits. Um, and uh, as I say, this year we, uh, we saw the introduction of the, of the first four trait uh, variety, um, and uh, the majority, uh, of, well, at least in our portfolio, uh, they have at least three traits, including what's other resistant EUIV and RLM7 pretty much as a standard trait. And, and I said the only, uh, the only reason why we work on it and we put so much effort is because we want to provide genetic solutions uh, to, to a problem. Um, because we've seen that for TUIV at the moment, uh, I think a chemical solution is, is um, it, it's very difficult and the genetic is very effective. So, and this is, I mean, for me, this is where, where I see the true benefit of every, of any trait, when you can provide a solution, which is much better than anything else around. Um, uh, so, um, and because it comes as a standard with a, with a bag of seed. So it's, it's an insurance which is there. Not every year, not every location will be heavy on infection, although it's becoming more and more prevalent every year. Uh, but when it happens, the solution is there. Building in your varieties, the same with the pot shutter resistance. Um, not every year, not every location will have hailstones, you have um, adverse harvest conditions. Uh, but when it happens, it, it will be there. Uh, so, uh, I think stacking the trades and at the same time uh, increasing the yield potential year on year is where the crop should be and, uh, well, at least from my point of view, as a, um, uh, as a breeder and as a scientist that's working on, on, on rape, um, uh, that's, um, that makes it uh, worthwhile to see those solutions on farm. Fantastic. Vas, thank you very much for your time and your expertise this morning. Um, uh, thank you very much for everybody to take the time in, in dialing in. Just a couple of final things for me. Um, uh, firstly, for those of you um, uh, that want basis points, if you could please on the question uh, function, if you could send us your, your name, your basis number and your postcode. And that will be enough for us to, to submit um, uh, off the basis for the points for this morning session. And then um, uh, before we go, just a reminder that, um, as I said at the start, this is one of a series um, covering the main arable crops um, for the UK. The next one being uh, at the same time on the 14th of July, where we'll be joined with Ed Flatman, who's our um, uh, uh, head wheat breeder uh, for the UK. Uh, to, to talk all things wheat and wheat breeding. Um, so again, thank you very much for your participation. Um, uh, it's been a really good morning and really good to, to talk around some of the key challenges and um, uh, key technologies um, come in and, 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 and already on the market for, for all rape. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you on the 14th. Goodbye. <laughs>